Uh, Gunnar, it's wonderful to be here with you, a true honor. Uh, the first question that I want to ask you is about a video I watched recently wherein you stated, architecture is a progression from the past through the present into the future. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on what you mean by that. By what I mean by that is that we are on this bridge that is that is uh, one end of the bridge is in the past, and that's our, our heritage and all that. And uh, the other end is in the other side of the river or the bridge, and that is future. And that is, we have to forget about this side, but we have to look at, at the other side. And we, so that's, that's, I think that's the architectural Architect, the role of architecture is to, to, uh, to recognize that, that, that we are progressing. So in the meantime, how does architecture create that continuum from past to present to future? Well, that's up to the, up to the doer. I, I really don't want to talk, to talk in terms of architecture theory about, about this. But individually, you know, I, I'm, I'm creating that myself, this knowing history, having seen and knowing uh, where we are and having some, uh, some dreams for where we're going or understanding. So that's, that's the bridge and that is within me. And so uh, I, I, I can only speak about that. By, by the way, I will only speak about where I am, where I feel. I, I cannot represent the, 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 the uh, uh, historical society. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I wouldn't ask you too much about no. that, but I do want to ask you a little bit about your parents and their influence on you, and then we can talk exclusively about you. Um, you were born in Riga, Latvia, mm -hmm. and from what I understand, your childhood was really steeped in the mythology of your country, and both of your parents were scholars and folklorists who studied the cultural heritage of the Latvian people. And so I wanted to ask, in what way were they folklorists, and, and how did that influence you? Um, they were, first of all, you have to know that the, that's a great folklore achievement is the Latvian songs, the folk songs, which is, is uh, uh, under the UNESCO protection now, because they, that's a great, great kind of uh, heritage uh, uh, Improvement, not improvement, but uh, manifestation. So my my father was uh, and mother was co collecting Latvian folk anecdotes and sayings. So they were volumes and volumes of 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 the sayings and anecdotes that were uh, expressive of of uh, the Latvian uh, folk culture. You know, K. Kaiser in the book, The Architecture of Gunnar Berger stated, initially, Gunnar is as difficult to grasp as his architecture. A stranger overhearing a Burkert's conversation would not know whether he was an architect, an Eastern European poet enlivened by sudden <coughs> freedom, or a Jungian psychologist. Do you think you get that from your parents? Where does, where does that sort of diversity of personality come from? Well, I am um, I, uh, a believer in destiny in many ways and also in a certain genetic inheritance and all that. My father studied psychology and philosophy and, and, um, and so that's why my mother was educated all the time and very, very well, very well regarded by, by her uh, students and you know and people around for years as a consultant and, and all that. I grew up in in a very uh, well uh, organized milieu. You know, with, with my mother, I was not spoiled like the kids are now. Uh, <laughs> I, I I had to have my my principles or, and all that, and by the name, the name, the principles. We'll come back to that because I'm using that in architecture. The principles, not not theories or that. That's principles. But 
And uh, so I lost your, your question now. But um, uh, yes, it was my education, basically. And, and uh, one of, of course, it's, you call it the European education also, but it's also a little special because of my parents' uh, parents' uh, connection to the to the development of, of thought and an idea. Is it true that when you were 13, while attending the first gymnasium in Riga, you saw a classmate's architectural rendering? And this was a boy named Bernsons, who instantly decided at that point <coughs> that he wanted to become an architect. At 13? Uh, well, it was one. One more, <laughs> fourteen maybe, but <laughs> but oh, but yeah, still <laughs> still early early years. Yes, that's true. Nothing because else. is in in that's that's the only one that has been recorded as 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 the beginning of my career of my thinking in architecture and my following. This has been my guiding guiding thought to be an architect and. Why? Because the, this rendering was an architectural style rendering that, of course, depicted the building and all that. And, and uh, I have, up, up to then, I have been drawing, you know, pots, pans, and apples, and, and all that in the drawing class. But then I, I saw this, and I said, no, I want to do this. And, and from there on, uh, I never changed. What was it about Bernstein's drawing that struck you so profoundly? Because it was architecture. It was a it was a building. It was a perspective type of building. You know, it had the qualities that uh, formerly I have not formerly I have not used. You know, and and I said, well, that's that's what that's what the future is for me. Did you ever find out what happened to Bernstein? No, I I. I don't I know he was the son of our one of our teachers at the high school, and uh, um, I, I know his his uh, one of his relatives were trying to get hold of me and trying to find out more about it. So, but that's that's gone. Now. Yeah. <coughs> so you completed two degrees in engineering and in architecture at the Technische Hochschule in Stuttgart, and were exposed to both. That Bauhaus and vernacular design. It seems like both are, are pretty profound influences on you. Would you agree with that? Would you, do you feel that that is the case? Well, let's say that I agree, but I need a little time to explain a little Please. more about myself. Because in, in a way, I am a little different from, from uh, uh, a lot of the other people at the th I started in an office because I came from Germany from having finished the Thea Stuttgart uh, and the course which was a unique course. Stuttgart and, and Zurich and, and Berlin were the top schools, the top uh, engineering school, Technische Hochschule. And uh, <coughs> of course, uh, you can imagine, at least you have seen it in pictures, but others have been kind of experience. Germany was absolutely in rubble in the cities. So at the schools of architecture, the, the uh, courses the, shifted to, to practical uh, matters, you know, how to deal with the rubble of the cities, how we can build a new urban environment from what's there. So actually, a lot of the education was on recycling uh, rubble, let's say, and making pre-stressed, pre, you know, pre-stressed uh, members, uh, structural members, or brick, or box, or, and all that, and basically the, the mentality was practical. It was, and not, there was not much talk about architectural philosophy or or, or theories and all that. Nobody wanted to, to hear that. Everybody had to do hands-on architecture, you know. And that is uh, uh, even well. I'm I'm under under uh, underestimating a little bit uh, what's going what's going on. But for me, 
uh, I was there at the time at the school. I was the youngest, youngest architect because the other architects who came, the other students who came, they came from the, you know, from the war years, and they were at least five years older than I was. I was, uh, I was the youngest. So uh, also, I was the, uh, I was maybe the least interested in in rebuilding, uh, working with rubble, because I was looking over the Baltic, I was looking at Finland, I was looking at Sweden, you know, um, <coughs> for, um, for, uh, for architecture, that architects that I liked, that were, you know, that were uh, talking, that I, what I understand, I didn't want to get involved into pragmatics all the time. So, uh, there, um, um, uh, that's why um, I'm coming back to your question, I go around, but your question was about, the influence of vernacular the, and Bauhaus. Yeah, the influence, all right. The Bauhaus was very influential in, again, in the visual sense. Again, I have to say that a lot of my, my uh, uh, learning about architecture and architects and all that is strictly visual. I, I, have, I don't read, I don't read manu, manu, manuals, I don't read philosophies, I don't read anything. But coming back to that, the the uh, the Technische Hochschule Stuttgart was um, received a number of Bauhaus teachers, and our dean was a Bauhaus, Do dean Dutcher was a Bauhaus dean. We had uh, in interiors Professor Schneck, and uh, then 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 the Bau uh, Baumeister was was in in painting. You know that we had the faculty of Bauhaus people there. And next to, next more important thing is that right across the street practically from the uh, college, you know, from the, our building was the, the Weissenhof Siegung. Now Weissenhof was, was a uh, arrangement of buildings by all the modernists. There was Miss Wendro, there was Alto, Sharoon, and you name. And, and they, everybody had a building. It was almost like a village. village. So sometimes we had, when we had a drawing class in, in, in um, uh, we went, we were put to, to sketch uh, Corbu, one of Corbu's villas there, you know. And anyway, so uh, this thing sort of was absorbed, you know, inhaled, <laughs> as I said, and, and uh, without <clears throat> really identifying at that time. Now, now it's different. <clears throat> so I read that you first became interested in Eliel and Eero Saarinen from the U.S. Information Agency Library and came to Birmingham, Michigan in December of 1949 to seek work with them. Did you have a job lined up or did you just pop in? No, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, I was interested in the Sardinans, yes. Of course, at that time, the older Sardinan, Elia, was, was really what, what, what was the heavyweight in this. And, and about Aero, I didn't know, I know the name Sardin, and the next thing I knew <coughs> was exquisite, exquisite uh, drawings that I saw published of the first tech center, um, and then from for you uh, know, which was uh, done by Jay Barr, which was an excellent, excellent renderer, and uh, also that um, some of the school, some of the school buildings, Drake. For instance, Drake University also had buildings, and they were in color. When I was studying, we were just black and white, you know, black and white ink or charcoal or whatever. Color didn't exist, you know, it's sort of Messian type. <laughs> but, <clears throat> uh, and then, then uh, I was taken by the, why that? And then, certainly, you're right now, you're coming to my coming over, fine. I came over, I had no introduction, I had nothing. I had a letter from my professor who had previously visited Sardinan, and he said, well, there's a guy, so, 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 so. And, and uh, so I came in uh, expecting like um, 
in Europe is that the architect's residence and his office is, is you know, together. And so I was looking for his, <clears throat> for his residence. Finally, after I uh, was unloaded here on the corner of Woodward and Long, Long Lake, uh, <laughs> I, I went over to, to Kingsley Inn, and that one was a little, little inn, asking for, uh, for, um, uh, for Sarnan. Nobody knew. Nobody knew Sarnan. So I sort of checked in my suitcase, that's all I had, I checked in, but, and uh, I went further looking for, finally I found somebody who said, well, you go down the line, uh, down, uh, down on, on uh, it's not map, it's, um, uh, Three, forgot. Uh, and <clears throat> there's his house. I went to his house, Just and then I knocked at the door, and they said, "No, no, no. Here's his office is back <laughs> there." <clears throat> so I, I go back there. I was his office. Uh, <clears throat> I knock on. Uh, I go in, and and uh, oh yes, yes. And uh, a nice man comes out. Um, a villa von Moltke, who was uh, known. He was a good architect, planner, and he was, he was a, a, a German kind of German aristocrat. And he was giving Errol little hints on, on how, to, how to move around in, in the world. And so he was the greeter for, you know, for a, a greenhorn like me, you know. He, so he took me under his wing and, and showed me around, but he said, you know, uh, Error cannot see you. I said, well, well, when can he see me? He said, well, tonight at 3 o'clock in, in 3 o'clock in the morning, I can see where I can get you there. So, <clears throat> so uh, all right, what do I do? So a nice, nice man, Dave Gear, whose house was nearby, took me over and uh, gave me a glass of scotch, which I didn't understand. I never had scotch before, and and uh, I <coughs> didn't like that very much. But so I stayed there till three o'clock in the morning, and then I walked over Woodward, and you know to to, to, the, to the interview. And then what happened? Ah, uh, there are stories about that too. <coughs> Getting good, right? Uh, <laughs> So I go there, and um, uh, there is, uh, 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 you know, there may be a number of people around, maybe one, two, but not many. But then there's another young, another man standing next to her, and, and he's, uh, he is uh, Japanese. That's so far on. And so we go over, and Arrow said, well, gee, I, I, General Motors just closed, because they, you know, whatever uh, arrangements, and uh, I cannot really uh, give you a position now. I cannot, but, but I'll keep you in mind. Uh, so that Japanese fellow said, well, come, work for me. Well, I said, well, where are you? He said, I'm in St. Louis. I said, no, that's too far for me. I kind of mixed up St. Louis. I, I knew St. Louis blues, and that they were kind of See, down in New Orleans, you know. <laughs> and I, he said, I'm in St. Louis. I said, no, I, I want to stay closer to the East Coast. So Arrow uh, was kind enough to arrange for me to go to Pontiac, not Pontiac, to Pontiac has stayed overnight. I go to Chicago and, and uh, with Parkinson Will interview, and, and they, they took me, they took me on. So you turned Minoru Yamasaki down? Yes, at it? that time. You yeah. did, you turned it down. Yes, I'm sorry yes. To no way. Out of St. Louis no and way. No St. Louis. Way. I've done it before, after that one more time, but that's <laughs> 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 So in 1951, you actually were invited to join Saarinen and his firm, and you worked side by side with Kevin Roche, Robert Venturi, and John Dinkaloo. Did you all get along? Was there much competition between you at that time? Uh, no, no, not at all. I, um, I had great admiration for John Dinklu. Of course, he was the genius thinker. I, as, when I came in, I didn't recognize anyone really for what is true until I 
get into the action and see who is doing what. Uh, Venturi, I was sitting next to, next to Venturi in, in the drafting room, and uh, um, so I knew him, and third one was, uh, well, they were all great names now that you think about it. And um, Venturi was almost okay. <laughs> 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 and one thing is he, he he used, he used ex very kind of exquisite English language, you know, which some of the words I didn't understand. And, and then also he didn't like anything that he was doing. He was always cussing. Uh, he, he did something and, and all the time, and, and I, I couldn't see that. You know, I was in the thinking, I th was thinking first before I was drawing. And, and all that. And that we can come to that when we talk to the analysis about how they work. But uh, so that, that's, uh, uh, but I was on, I was not on the, on the right hand or left hand with arrow. I was somewhere uh, coming up, you know, through the ranks there. Well, while you were with him, you worked on the General Motors Technical Center and the Concordia Senior College in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And then three years later, just a short three years later in 1954, you won the Young Designer of the Year Award from the Akron Museum of Art. So did that change your outlook or your prospects or your relationship with Aaron? No. No, no, because that was not that was not a major, major, uh, major achievement. Uh, Designer of the Year? No. Yeah, well, uh, in furniture, you know, that was furniture actually. <clears throat> so, but but I was uh, I was looking at at uh, Eros, and I noticed that he is doing well in this furniture design area, and and he's getting things built. And I sort of thought that the way for me to get out of architecture or to get started. I started with furniture, something small that I can handle all by myself, that I don't need an office, I don't need anybody, you know, I can do myself. And I, So I, I did these, these uh, offered these uh, furniture designs, and one was the Akron, they, they picked that up, you know, I, I sent it in actually, and they, they gave me this, this, this award, which is... You mentioned destiny before, Gunnar. Yeah. And <clears throat> I know that you're often asked about why you wanted to work for the Sarinans, and you usually address the objectives and the similarities and the working habits and so forth. Um, but you mentioned Destiny before, and I, I read recently that you now believe that working for the Sarinans was your destiny. And, and so I want to know in what <clears throat> way do you believe that it was your destiny? Uh, because it was a major development in my world in my life um, and uh, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm still debating on and on why, why did I come for Arrow and why did Arrow took me you know what, a, what did he see in me uh, that reminded him of something maybe it was my, my northern European heritage and, and all that and, uh, and then uh, you know, these things still go through my mind, and of course, I, I left Arrow after uh, four years or so, and uh, <clears throat> I had arrived at a point where I said, I am not going to work like he is working, because I, I believe in different, in different uh, methodologies and, and all that. And, um, so, uh, but the beginning was, that was the destiny that somehow I, we, I landed here in Bloomfield Hills in spite of everything, you know, and that's, that has been like the drawing on a wall at the school, high school, you know, it was a point of destiny. This landing here was a point of destiny, you know, and, and, and that, of course, shaped my career from there on. I know that um, you've also been influenced by Alvar Alto. Who was more of an influence, Saarinen or Alto? Say again? Who was more of an influence to you, Saarinen or Alto? Uh, <clears throat> well, Alto was, was uh, first influence because he was, of course, a, re a regional 
thinker, you know, that he did architecture that I, I could understand. <clears throat> I was not interested in dogmas and or directions. I was not interested in direct, right, direct means or direct uh, uh, group or, or corbu because I was, my methodology is that I, I'm doing it subconsciously. I know all of them, and I don't like any of them, but I know all of them. So that my mind, and I believe very much in, in intuitive devel development of concepts and all that, that, that it is my brain does the synthesis, or, or my, the selection of the ingredients, what I take from one of the next to the next which I have not done any direct, uh, direct uh, uh, take from any of them. I want to talk to you actually at length about the impact of the subconscious, but I'm going to get to that in just a few minutes. Um, the second time Minoru Yamasaki offered you a job, you said yes, and you became chief designer for the Reynolds Metals Building um, the educational building and the educational building at Wayne State University and the Jaharan Air Terminal. But by 1959, you stated, I had listened long enough. My apprenticeship was over. Now it was my turn to speak. Yeah. And you started your own firm. Yeah. Um, what did you intend to say when it was your turn to speak? What was your intent at that time okay. in starting your own <laughs> Yeah, you, you kind of rattled off a number of projects which I, which were interesting. You know, they were they were part of the development because, like Reynolds Aluminum Building, was I, I was hired there maybe more for getting the the sudden and thinking you know that I had to use on the Reynolds. There was another architect, Harold Sochia, who was hired, and between Harold and I. We did the Reynolds metal concept, you know, not the, the, the overall concept, but, but the metal, you know, the, yes. the panels, the screens, you know, and, and all that. So then another development in Yama was that when he discovered the shock baton, you know, the, the baton that, that, that he could do these very fine, uh, intricate designs for facades that you saw maybe today show that, that uh, and the shock baton became, he dropped everything and, and went into the shock baton. Finally, I worked with Yamo on an airport in, in Saudi Arabia on a shock baton based designs and all that. So I had the metal technology and I had the concrete technology and, and so I felt that that neither one of them would, you know, I would kind of continue either, either what I was doing or what, what, what Yama is doing. So um, then you, you ask me what I, how I left, what yeah, was what, what were you, when you started your own <laughs> firm, what were your intentions, what were your aspirations and hopes at that time? Well, of course, we have to get a little bit on 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 the methodology of, of creativity, so of creativity. Let's, let's talk about that. And and I I could not agree with Eros' way of designing. You Why? Know? Why so? Because it was not a um, concept that sprung out of well, here we go, a certain intuition, you know, certain certain subconscious understanding of, of the problem and some intuition and making the statements. He was uh, inviting from all of us to say something, you know, to do something. And then he would say, well, whatever he liked, and he would say that, and he would develop further, or we would develop further. And slowly it came to, to, to an agreement and with his uh, understanding of the problem. So uh, I, I couldn't work that way because my methodology is, is, is different. I, <clears throat> so. Well, in the book, Buildings, Projects, and Thoughts, when asked whether you have a theory of your own that you follow, you stated each solution is based on a theory that develops in the process. 
Well, that's what I mean. I have a theory for each of the projects. I don't like the theories that, that even if before I start the project, I have somebody's theory, you know, that, that, and no, I don't. I start working and then the theory comes. Right, uh, it's more the, uh, uh, what I would say, the principle. The, the principles come in, you know, principle for this, principle, that, 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 and, and they, they move the project forward. How does a theory develop in the process? Is it already consciously there that no. you wait for it to no. sort of? No, no I, uh, <clears throat> I'm very much a uh, believer in subconscious thinking and uh, uh, about, um, in simple terms, it's you acquire all the possible information you can about the project. And you can, then you can go away. You can go, you can swim, you can ski, you can do, because your mind is doing the work, you know. So it's germinating? Or? It's, yeah, it's, 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 it does the work while you are relaxing, so to say. And then, then the, the, the concepts appear, you know, and the concepts, there's a concept appears, you know. And that's what I, what I, that's my belief of creativity, and that's how Yama works, actually. Yama, when, when, I, when I went for, to Yama, I went to him for the reason that, that he was spontaneous and, and in, you know, intuitive kind of creator. He was not laboring on, you know, like Eros said, um, architecture is a patient search. Well. Yeah, but, but each project, you know, you cannot go through this endless search for, for each one. You, you said that what we call thinking is a very slow process of making contact with the subconscious. It happens at enormous speed, and it is going on wherever you are, whether you are asleep or awake. But it seems to me that you have to have an awful lot of faith in your subconscious if you're waiting for the ideas to come. Well, you have to have a lot of storage, yes, in your in your mind, you know, and and in the thinking, you are trying to make connection with the information that you you have, you know, and and uh, sometimes you know it is it is spontaneous and, and because you cannot do more than what's in your head. You, what's in your head comes either through your ears or through your eyes, and that's all stored there. And then you, that's what you have to work with. Now, then it is, that's the talent, call it, that you have is how you combine this. How do you put them, you know, how do you synthesize it all at the moment you say, that's an idea, you know. So that, combinatorial creativity, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And, <clears throat> It, uh, you know, I stopped teaching design in a way because I, I myself relied so much on intuitive and, and thinking all that, that, that uh, this is the, the design process that you teach is, was so slow that you have to teach them, go, oh guys, you know, you go to the library for the next week and, and, and look at the, do this, this, you know, to, you have to spend a lot of time allowing them to feed their brain uh, with information so that, so that uh, we can progress with the, with the you know, design thinking. You used the word dogma earlier on in our interview today, and I seem to get a sense um, that you disdain dogma. Yes. Um, and an article in Architecture News made me think of you. Um, and this is uh, the quote. Um, Does anyone now believe that modernism in any way of the art simply disappeared into, the black, into a black hole to make, in order to make room for postmodernism? You don't have to go back far in time to discover trendy architectural ac academics that were promulgating variations on this theme. As a result of this massive historical distortion codified in both highbrow architectural journalism and college texts, architects dedicated to thinking of modernism as an ever-regenerative mindset and rigorous toolkit 
the bold design were marginalized. Would you agree? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Give me the text. <laughs> uh, well. I know. Get comfortable. No, no, no. Whatever goes in your ears, you know. But I, it didn't go in my ears. Do you right? No. <laughs> That's low. Now, give me the essence. Okay. Do you feel that modernism has been marginalized by postmodernism? Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you talk about oh, yeah. that? Well, I, well, definitely I can talk about it, but it comes back to Arrow. Um, and I, I, I declared somewhere else that postmodernism would have not happened in architecture, not in literature, whatever else, but in architecture if Arrow had lived. That's a because po because postmodernism was really came out of certain boredom for the the turned on minds you know that had to do something and then they run out of things you know and so th they turn back and now they they use the uh, old uh, cliche of of, of applique you know and. Uh, and all that, and did postmodernism in architecture. And it is all, as, as you well know, some is being torn down, some is being uh, discredited indefinitely, and, and it has never really achieved any, any significant architecture, as, as I would call it, postmodern architecture, in the most brutal sense of postmodernism. You know. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by the most? Well, in, in the in the palladios, <laughs> you know, the direct kind of emulations of of uh, architectural forms of past. What has been discredited? You mentioned that that there are certain postmodern ideas, beliefs, or buildings have been discredited. What has been well, discredited? Well, this is you can go to the. To the Portland Museum by Graves that is going apart in, in on the on the skin and all that. It is unlivable spaces that's you no know, uh, and and it's 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 a it's a disaster as far as build you know and that was the kind of a postmodern building and I I know that well that building well and, and forgive me for that was I was one of the ten invited to, to work on it, you know. And then, then Philip Johnson was joined into the jury. And he took me off and put Graves in. Why? Because I was definitely not a PM person. I was just, you know. And he just wouldn't thank me. So, all right, so he got his way and so it's not sour grapes about about the Portland. You you can no, I find know. out. I know. That's why I wanted to ask you about <laughs> yeah. it because I think it's important to talk yeah, about. Yeah. Um, why do you think that this wave of postmodernism um, has been so popular? Has been so? Why the, what, What's with the architect thing? Well, <clears throat> I. I think that the postmodernism has to be uh, a little bit um, uh, categorized, yes, in some way, because you, you find it mostly in, in residential building and smaller structures and all that. Larger structures, postmodernism doesn't come that that uh, recognized. You know, that, okay, you can say Philip Johnson's AT and T, you know. With, with a, in, in, is a postmodern building, you know, it, so we can live with that one. But, but um, the postmodernisms that are the, the um, well, as I said, that the, the, the replicas and, and, and all that, that, that kind of definitely uh, stab the modernism and say, oh, well, well, we don't like you. And, so uh, <clears throat> I think that that era is gone, if I might say so. Yeah. yeah. How, and would you, how would you categorize or describe the, the current area that we're in, the current times that we're in? 
well, that of that, um, there is a the form formalism, and there is the technology, and we'll, we have two two things going on. One is the building technology, you know, that is developing very nicely. You know, it's it's an area of of of, of conservation and 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 controls of of everything, sun and, and all that. That's one. The other one is is a decadent one that that works with form. That uh, is the computer generated now that has no principles. You know, they have no uh, nothing to judge by. You just look at it all, and that's that's ability. You don't know where it's coming from so and what's the soul. function. No, sh there's no soul. They don't even have the buildings that are built. They don't know what to do for the upper half because. You know, it's it's just a uh, uh, just a structure and elevators and something. You know, and there's not, so I'm talking about the high buildings that are the contorted buildings and all that. So, but even then, it's very hard. And again, I don't I don't want to be on on a kind of a, a judge judge bench here saying how I feel because uh, it's a much deeper subject to get into. But I, I, I really am very concerned about the, the future of architecture. Well, you were actually a real pioneer in trying to combat urban sprawl, and I'd love to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to just look for where I have my very specific questions for you on that. Um, but in the meantime, actually, I want to ask you about a quote while I'm looking. You said that you have to be strong as an architect. You cannot turn your face. You have to take a beating and come back for more. Why is that? Why is that the case in architecture? Well, that, that is the way it is. And, uh, and here, maybe it's, uh, it's, it's the point, uh, point where I, I can uh, inject the uh, Aristotelian uh, suggestion that that uh, what I walk when I walked away from Sardinian, uh, what I took with me as influences were just this, you know, the perseverance, the you know the uh, the following an idea and 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 uh, just just strength in. In, in, and, and in belief, and, and then the execution of your idea, you know? And so uh, um, that is uh, something that is part of the personality, you know? Of, it's not, it's not the, you don't teach it in school. I understand that. You, don't, you cannot teach it. It's a personality trait, you know, strength. Okay. I can't help but wonder if Saarinen recognized that in you at three o'clock in the morning that well, day that you first met. Well, that I don't know, because he knew that I came from the war out of the Europe that was in rubble. That you have to have something to go through that and and bring back something, a diploma, you know, or you know. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about some of the work that you've done to try to contain urban sprawl. Um, a great example of this is your subterranean urban system study in 1974. Mm -hmm. And you received a fellowship grant from the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts. Um, and back then you stated, there are too many bu individual buildings today. Not every physical or functional need deserves the right to become a visual object in our landscape nor does it have the right to occupy a piece of land exerting its visual effects. Most likely its presence is not needed for the formation of our urban fabric. We have to impose a birth control upon certain buildings and other structures in order to check the ugliness of urban sprawl. Achieving this de-escalation is one of the most difficult tasks confronting society and the architect today. Gunnar, you wrote this 40 years ago. Yes. 40 years ago. How do you feel about it all now? 
I feel forgotten because I think that I, I, what I said, I think I predicted that I could have said today, you know, I would have said the same thing. And of course, that is a preamble to our study uh, where we put buildings on the ground or at least earth covered buildings and they were all the all the storages and mechanical and all the things that don't belong, you know, on our streets, where we can put parks in there and put the damn stuff underground, you know, and 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 uh, gain gain people land, people space, you know, and uh, so then I went as far as going into the traffic and utilities and all that. It made a lot of sense <laughs> the time. <laughs> it definitely does. You know, when more people than ever before are making pilgrimages to the cities, more people are living in cities than they ever have before. And this pattern seems to be continuing in, in really st significant statistical ways. Yeah. Um, what do you see the future being for the way that people live in cities? How do you see this being able to be managed? Well, uh, the thing is that that I don't see that much. I read now what people say, what wise people say, and, and they 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 uh, suggest that it will be more urban living and more high-rise living and and all that. That high-rise will be accepted more and and uh, that sort of thing. I uh, I really cannot predict. I. I'm not as sharp as I was 40 years ago. <laughs> no, I don't think that's no. true. <clears throat> um, you're working on uh, two major projects now in mm -hmm. Latvia. You're working on the renovation and enlargement of the Museum of the Occupation of Latvia, where you grew up. Mm -hmm. um, what is it like to go back there now? Because you're also working on the Latvia National Library, a project that you've been involved in now for close to 22 years. Yeah. Well, there's going back on several levels, you know. Personally, I'm, I am back and I, I can feather into, emotionally I'm there, you know. I, I, I'm a little bit suffering maybe from, from the way it, uh, the, the, the uh, population is, is organized and all that. But <clears throat> uh, technically, uh, it was a project that uh, was first in the Baltic states and on, on that side of the, of the Baltic was that uh, it was designed with the new rules, new rules, you know, new, new building codes. Uh, there were the Russian codes which were so orthodox that you couldn't believe it. And then when, when there was a German building code, there was a building in the U.S. United States National Building Code, they were looking. We had to build a building so that the world would accept it uh, as a, as a uh, acceptable uh, structure because of the difference, you know. Forgetting handicaps and, and, and all that, you know, just, just in terms of uh, climate control and, and ventilation and, and uh, light admission and all that. It, it was uh, not covered in it, so we had to write practically a manual how to build the building, you know. So it, it, it helped that uh, my co-associates were, were here, flooring associates in mechanical, and, and skilling Les Robertson in, in structures. And uh, so we, working together, we, we tried to upgrade the whole thing and and uh, it took years and years and years to do it you have been practicing for <coughs> 50 years now over 50 years um, what is the biggest change that you've witnessed in what in architecture in the way that architecture is being practiced in the way that it's being accepted in the trends that are popular <coughs> or not popular well, I think the biggest change is that that uh, there is more emphasis on on uh, uh, on the technology of the building, as I mentioned before, whether you know of the uh, 
uh, use of uh, of uh, recycled materials, you you know, and and the the green thinking of about green architecture, the uh, this, the technology of uh, facades that are doing fantastic things, you know, in in controlling like climate and all that, that and. I would like to say at this point that that I don't know where the where the uh, funds are coming for it because I know we we couldn't think about that at all. We had to account for every nail, you know. We had to go through uh, through uh, uh, man, uh, you know cost management, and and we right now I can see that a building that is uh, estimated to go for 100 million actually gets. A Built for two hundred million dollars, and there's some kind of uh, big uh, generosity coming. For <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, the, well, the change is, I think that that is the technology, and of course, the computer is is the big change, and and uh, um, and I'm to not sure Michigan yet Michigan what the what the results will be. To seek work, do you have? Do you have a job, Mr. Cordy? Or do you just talk about it? Well, personally, you know, I'm using computer. You know, the the, the Riga Riga couldn't be get built without you know without all that. So they are, but it is after concept, you know, where they they computer helps to build, you know. But then when when you make computer conceptualize, then I don't know how to deal with that because. Who is behind the computer doesn't have enough up here, anyway, and and he's doing this, this uh, image, not image, or this form, and um, without knowing what was really, what are all the other uh, parameters in it, you know. So, I don't know. Gunnar, deep in my research, I found a quote by the structural engineer. Leslie Robertson. And Leslie described you in a way that I thought was really special. And I wanted to share that with the audience uh, before we finish. Um, Leslie described you as a titanium person, a person who has some special element or spark that makes them stronger than other individuals. And I want to thank you for being that titanium person, for being the artist architect that you are, and for helping to make the world a more beautiful and special place. Thank you. Okay. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.